Oh. Hello, and thank you for tuning in to McDougal's Medicine with Dr. John and Mary McDougal. I'm their daughter and your host, Heather McDougal. And tonight, just like every night, we'll try to get to as many questions as we possibly can. But first, I want to say hi to you, Mom and Dad, Dr. McDougal and Mary. How are you? Well, I'm uh, just fine. Uh, but are we going to start getting together every night with them at five, Heather, or just Sunday nights? Well, she always yes. says that. All right. right. All right. Every every she Sunday night. Like, she, knows that, yeah. she knows that everybody realizes that she's talking about well, every time. I don't want to show up every night at five o'clock. <laughs> but we will be here every night, every Sunday night, 5 p.m. Pacific time, <laughs> to introduce your friends and relatives to another point of view, one that happens to work. And one that isn't tied to industry and dishonesty. You know, I got my 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 Washington Post out this morning. I know this is backwards, but this is an article, bottom left-hand corner of the Washington Post, okay? Bottom left-hand corner, it's about the food industry pays influencer dietitians to shape your eating habits. They are hiring dietitians to advertise supplements and the sugar industry and the Coca-Cola industry to come out with positive messages about health to you. They're hiring these professionals. It's, you don't stand a chance. They got all the money. You know, I, I know they're hiring doctors to do this also, but it's going to get worse because they figured out it works and nobody will stop them. There's just no honesty here at all. You don't. Um, there's like six or eight different, they're like Instagram and yeah, they're right TikTok here. and they're right here. Today's I mean, Washington Post things, Sunday. All Sunday, the what is today? The, the September 16th? 17th, 17th, 16th. I think. Oh. Whatever. <laughs> 17. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. All right. You see this? This is the front page of the Wall Washington Post. And it just, you know, I was even a bit shocked that there's this much dishonesty going on. You know, I thought most of it they kept it undercover and they didn't report it to the public so they knew it any better that these people are just being lied to. And this one happened to be all about aspartame. Well, that's and what they're how, objecting to. Yeah, they, all these people were hired to tell how wonderful aspartame oh, but, was. But they also work for the supplement industry. Well, I know they do too, but so. I mean, it just struck me as... Okay, uh, as far as I know, the only honest, direct information you can get <laughs> any place on the internet for sure is five o'clock. Sundays, Pacific time, 5 o'clock p.m. with Dr. John, Mary, and Heather McDougall. So count on it, which brings me to my next point. Disclaimer. Okay, uh, today's Annals of Internal Medicine, I'm sure you all read your copies of the Annals, right? Of you don't take 13 medical journals? <laughs> Good. That's what I have you for, Dan. <laughs> I thought everybody did. All right, look, I've, I've been talking to you guys about, uh, ladies and gentlemen, about Overdiagnosis when you go through a screening program, okay? Okay, you're, you're asked to have your colon checked, your breast checked, your prostate checked, etc. Well, what happens is they find a lot of disease that would never have troubled you. you. You would have never learned about it. It would have never shown up. You'd have died of something first. It's called overdiagnosis. And, and I was telling you that. Uh, that 10 out of 2,000 women were overdiagnosed when it came to breast cancer. Excuse me. In this paper right here, the Annals of Internal Medicine, this came up. Let's see, what is it? Mm -hmm. Anyways. Oh. It's, it, yeah, it, okay. Annals of Internal Medicine, volume 176. Is that the date? 2003. Doesn't make any difference. Well, so here it is. Here it is. So let me, no, let me look at it. No, Maybe I you look at it. Anyway, what it tells you is that. If you're in the age group of 70, yeah, September 2023. So it's September 2023. If you're in the age group between 70 and 74 years old, you have a 31% chance. That's like a one in three chance of being told you have breast cancer when it isn't a disease that'll kill you. 31%. This is the annals. This is the most respected journal an internist possibly gets. Well, 31%, that's like uh, 600 out of out of 2,000. It's terrible. I know, 30, and besides that, in the two-thirds that they find, there's really no good evidence that they make a positive difference in these people's lives. 
by surgery, radiation, chemo, extremes. Excuse me, I could I could show you any evidence that's not when it comes to amputating a woman's breast. Now, if that were the case, and yeah. and, and you have and, a one in three chance of being overdiagnosed, told you something that you have never suffered from. Well, or if 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 they found it yeah. and they had a cure for it. But they don't. I know, but if 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 they could fix it, then it'd be good no news. But... Well, then you'd have two thirds chance of being saved. Yeah, but you don't. I know. <laughs> you have a one third chance of being told you have breast cancer, but you don't have it. This is in the age group seventy to seventy four, and the age group seventy five to eighty four, it goes up to forty seven percent chance of being overdiagnosed. Really? Yeah. That's almost. That's one or two half. So if you're going to get a mammogram, uh, according to this paper right here, which is, you know, address the whole thing of overdiagnosis, that you have a one third to one half chance of being told you have breast cancer when you don't. And the most important thing to realize, not the most, the secondary most important thing to realize is that if you are in the in the half or the two thirds that it's correct, they have no treatments to have you live longer, except for maybe uh, Ketura. Kistura, Kiss Kali, Kiss Kali, and Kedura. These are new yeah, drugs. They're uh, they're uh, mono, uh, monoclonal antibody, monoclonal antibodies. I, I don't know what to say about them yet. Maybe there's a survival benefit, but there's been no survival benefit when it comes to uh, chemotherapy, which can't be explained by knocking the ovaries out. Knocking the ovaries out will cause you to live longer too, just like anti-estrogen drugs will. But I don't care how much surgery. I don't care how much of a woman you amputate, you will not save her life with surgery. And no, no credible doctor would argue with me. Okay, let's get on to some happier news. Oh, no, I wanted to tell you the other part here. This was kind of <laughs> shocking. Okay. Um, I love this. You bring me up to date on all the important news, medical news. Okay, I got another one for you. Here's one. This is the editorial that came with the article. Same journal, September 2023, Annals of Internal Medicine. Previous estimates of overdiagnosis in breast cancer has ranged as high as 38% of all women of all ages to as low as 12%. Okay, in other words, I gave you age, age groups that are over 70, but this says as many as 38% of women are overdiagnosed in all age groups. That's for breast cancer. And uh, let's see, it is estimated overdiagnosis in half, <laughs> half the prostate cancers. In other words, if That's you told you have prostate cancer, you have a 50% chance that you don't have a disease that will threaten your life or you should even want to know about it, okay? And then a 29% chance of being overdiagnosed by undergoing screening for breast for lung cancer. It's called, it's called low-dose computer tomography, screen-detected lung cancer. 29% overdiagnosis. You know, and they claim that this scanning for precancerous lesions is saving lives a tiny bit at best. And, and these are precancers. And yet 29% of people, we're not even talking about people who have, who go through regular chest x-rays or CAT scans. Get out of the business, okay? Get out of the business. And the only way you can safely get out of the business is to have your health so you don't have to deal with these people. Seriously, you don't want to deal with them. You know, when with the lies and the corruption, you talk about politics. Ladies and gentlemen, you're dealing with the medical business. These people are out to get your money. And by the way, they might want to help you too. Just maybe. And there are a whole group of doctors who do want to help you. And we spent last weekend with them. Oh, yeah, I had a great time. Let's talk about the weekend. Okay. Real positive yeah, thing for a couple of minutes and we'll answer questions. That, bring that up. We were at the Plantrition Project event last weekend in Palm Springs, California. And it was so great being back in person and seeing a lot of old friends and meeting new ones. And dad, Dr. McDougall, you were honored with the Luminary Award and gave an amazing presentation on Sunday night. So that was really wonderful to see. Well, I'm glad I impressed you, Heather, because part of my part of my goal in life is to impress you, impress you and your brother. <laughs> I have a hard time doing that, but this is the award that I was given. This is a hand painting 
I know it's backwards, but uh, the hand painting on Ray and Mary. Perfect. Then. It was, it's just beautiful. It's potatoes, all the colors, potatoes. And it was it for says, it was for the McDougals, by the way, not not John McDougals. No, it just says McDougals. Says McDougals for Heather too. Planting the seeds of change. Yeah. Anyway, it was a, it was a, a great weekend. I don't think so. It's not really no. not really important. No. It's the same old stuff. Yeah. Congratulations. Congratulations. You've been a good guy. Luminary yeah. Award. Anyway. Very, very nice. I, I, I feel good. Wonderful. I've gotten two other awards. I've gotten one from the state senate in Hawaii. Thank you for the work I did in Hawaii. And another one from the American College of Lifestyle Medicine. Don't plan on me getting an award from the <laughs> National Breast Cancer Surgeons Society. <laughs> <laughs> or even the colonoscopy society or whatever they are. I don't know. Anybody who gets, makes their money doing bad things to my patients is in trouble because I'm not going to let them alone. <laughs> anyway, that's uh, what well, was a good weekend. Uh, Heather, you know, the video is out. We've got to get it. Please sign up for our newsletter list so that we make sure you mail a copy as soon as Heather gets it of the award ceremony, plus a lecture, the best lecture I've ever given. You know, I, I'm not trying to brag. I, I worked re, I, I worked for 55 years <laughs> preparing this lecture. I really did. And, and putting it uh, on, on the slides took me six months. Certainly the last two weeks, that's all I did oh. was work on. But it goes, it flows from slide to slide to slide. It shows. I have experience. I may be old. <laughs> I may be a little slower than I used to be, but the experience showed. And you know, we put, we I want you to see that presentation. It's about my 55 years in medicine. And it talks about how I got into it, which most of you know. It talks about some of my mentors, Pritikin, uh, Dennis Burkett, Roy Kempner, or Roy Swank and Walter Kempner. You know, I talk about my mentors, and then I tied it in with life today and the future. And uh, the overall message was, and I give it to my colleagues, you know, what are you going to do? You know, Mary and I are old, you know, at, at best, who knows? But it's, it's your life, your future. What are you going to do? Okay, we ruined it, I know, but our parents ruined it too. <laughs> so did the parents before us. I'm really sorry about that, but you're going to be left to clean it up. And uh, I told the doctors and the dietitians and the nurses in this audience, you have to take advantage of your experience, your talents, your doctors, your dietitians, your food people. You don't know how to build Teslas. You don't know how to construct windmills. And it's not likely you're going to learn how. So how are you going to make your contribution? Well, your contribution will be made in telling the truth about food. The truth is, is that people are designed to live on a starch-based diet with fruits and vegetables. And the truth is, is we're gonna end up there whether you like it or not. And we can end up there in two ways. One, by the example that Pritikin gave, which is about war torn Europe. About war torn Europe, World War I and World War II. People had to change their diet. Is that the way you want mm -hmm. our future constructed by war? Or other disasters. Or, or the other example I gave was Dennis Burkett and the other people around the world who, prior to 1980, within our lifetime, ate a starch based diet for, you know, millions and million years. Because that's all they had. Well, they didn't Basically. have refrigerators, they didn't yeah. have train trucks, chips they throw around, you know, they didn't have the, the meat industry and the dairy industry hammering nonsense, lies in your face all day long to sell product. You know, there's never been a case of protein or calcium deficiency. You do know that, don't you? Well, you do if you listen to the show and read the research that I gave to you. I spent 55 <laughs> years putting this together for you. Good grief. Do me some honor. Show me that you at least to look at my stuff. <laughs> no, I know you do. I know you're busy. And I know you listen, but yeah, I guess that you're hearing a little of my frustration. I've known these things since 1978. Not the climate part. But the food part. And uh, I thought I'd change the world because I knew what I knew. Not because I'm a powerful person or particularly articulate, but because I had the truth. But I was wrong. I mean, the world has gotten worse, much worse. You know, back then, back then there was a, a obesity rate of fewer than 30%. 
now we're approaching you know 60 percent of some populations you know 80 percent of the people are overweight and uh, or, or, or overweight or obese half the people are pre-diabetic or diabetic you know god things are worse so anyways all my discovery all my self-inflation about how important i was going to be it didn't materialize and doesn't you know what can I say? I, I would like to have made a bigger difference, but I ain't done yet. I'm not done yet. Okay. Well, and I think I last think, I think one of the exciting things about the weekend was that there were so many, there was a whole younger generation of yeah. doctors, dietitians, nutritionists, professionals that are, you know, going to take on your message, Dad, and and continue what you're doing. So while there were some of the old guys there, no. there was there <laughs> were a whole many. bunch of young people there. And so that was really inspiring and hopeful and exciting. Well, we, we looked around the room and we decided, your mom and I, that we were the oldest people in there, except I found somebody older. So we weren't quite the oldest, but probably <laughs> within the top five, we're the oldest. But uh, yeah, they were they were very enthusiastic. And the other thing I told them, which I really would like to get across to them, is they are right. And the established medical profession is wrong when it comes to chronic disease. And I told them to stand up for the truth. Don't be, don't be, don't be frightened. I mean, I know these people are powerful and they they talk big and everything, but you've got the truth on your side. The, the research, the science is absolutely consistent. What they're doing doesn't work when it comes to chronic disease, and that it can be solved by doing one thing. Well, you got a lot of things to do, but one thing <laughs> that we'd like you to do, let's fix the food. It would solve so many problems, not just in disease, not just helping the climate, not just preventing serious infections with viral disease, but think about what it would do to our society. I think it could turn out to be a very positive thing. And uh, what I hope I instilled upon the people who are in attendance there, and I want to instill upon anybody that's listening here, is don't back down. They're wrong. We're right. Don't back down. And I've done the research to prove they're wrong. I've wrote it, written it all down for you. I put it on video. You're welcome to show my written words or my spoken words to anybody. Show me I'm wrong. Otherwise, I'll show you you're wrong. Stand by, stand back. Isn't that what they say? <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, not something like that. Something like that. <laughs> anyway, oh, wow. Well. Okay, let's have some fun. You got Are some you questions? ready for some questions? I got lots. All right, this is from Glenda. She wrote in, she wants to know if you've treated patients with thyroid nodules and if they've disappeared following the McDougall program. I, I take care of a lot of people with thyroid nodules. As many as 40% of the population has thyroid nodules. So, you know, you just, are, these, are these nodules you can feel or can are these feel. nodules you, you have to? You feel them, you do a neck exam. Oh, okay. And, you know, kind of get behind the patient and feel the thyroid. Okay. And then, of course, we have scans. You know, yeah. Have, okay. I just wanted to feel Yeah, but feeling, feeling nodules, I think it's 40%. It's pretty common. Yeah. People have thyroid nodules. And some of them are small, some of them are big, but most of them cause no trouble at all. And in general, you should not you should not worry about the thyroid nodules. So there, there are some tests they could do, radionuclides tests to indicate whether they're more likely to be benign or cancerous. And you know, the nice thing about thyroid cancer is it's one of the more treatable cancers. And I'll tell you why. You know, it's not just the thyroid gland, it's 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 the breast and the colon, et cetera, where the cells spread outside the body. And we have metastases. Well, how taking out the thyroid nodule, you're going to deal with the cancer that spread to your brain or your bones, et cetera. Well, when it comes to thyroid, we've got kind of an interesting situation, and that is we have a radioactive substance called I-131, and it kills thyroid tissue that has escaped to other parts of the body. Pretty cool, huh? So in that case, you know, patients do pretty good with thyroid cancer. Uh, you, have to have, uh, you have to have uh, radiation and or surgery. Uh, but as far as the disappearing, if you put somebody on thyroid medication, you suppress the thyroid gland, th you know, Synthroid, I'm talking about, you know, the regular old thyroid stuff you buy in the grocery store, you buy in the pharmacy, you put it on thyroid and what happens is the nodules will often disappear. I can't imagine that they disappear due to their diet, but you know, I'm, all, I'm often surprised. I, I don't see any 
direct. Uh, yeah, I, I I would have to think about it for a minute to make any direct connection. I was I was just thinking, you know, that thyroiditis, where you have an inflamed thyroid, is due to an autoimmune reaction where the body attacks itself. And I've told you I believe this is due to people eating foreign thyroid glands like pig and cow thyroid glands. I think that's the, the the cause. Now, once you become hypothyroid, then your thyroid stimulating hormone gets all excited, and makes lots of TSH. And that stimulates the thyroid gland. I don't know whether it, I don't, I, maybe it grows nodules for that reason, because I know when you treat it with thyroid and you correct that TSH stimulation, they'll disappear, but I, not by diet. So get your doctor to put you on some thyroid hormone if he or she thinks that's the right thing to do. But otherwise, don't be in great fear. Uh, you know, have it kind of checked out. Don't rush into surgery. But, you know, in Korea, they got really excited about about stamping out thyroid cancer. And they ended up screening a whole bunch of the Korean population. And Chris caused a tremendous fiasco there, operating and treating people that never should have been treated. And it's more than you want to know about thyroid, I know. <laughs> I love that. You're very thorough. Okay, next question. This is from Anthony. Uh, can pasta and bread get in the way of losing weight, even though they can be healthy starches? I doubt it. You know, we, we, we push the maximum weight loss program to, uh, to people who really want to rush it and, and, and claim to be having a hard time losing weight. And we take away bread and, and, and pasta from them. Bread, meaning what they've done with the wheat berry is they've changed it from one calorie per gram by grinding it and whatever refining goes on, they've increased the calorie concentration to two calories per gram. Well, white sugar is four calories per gram. Potatoes are less than one calorie per gram. Uh, meat and dairy are four calories per gram. Uh, rice is like one calorie per gram. You know, I'm, you, you double the calorie concentration, but don't even get close to what you get with meat and dairy. And oil is nine calories per gram, nine, not nine, four and a half times greater than flour. Okay, so anyway, let, let me tell you two parts of the story. Uh, one is, is that pasta is made with water. So that brings the calorie concentration or density back down to one. It's made of water. Okay. The other, the other thing I want you to know is about an experiment done at Michigan State University. And I'm going to be brief about this. It was published in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition in 1978. It was done in my alma mater. It may have been done even in my dormitory where I had my stroke. <laughs> It was right it was, about that time. Wasn't it was, it? You know, it was just a couple of years after I'd left, yeah. They did this experiment where they took moderately overweight men. And they asked them to eat 12 slices of bread a day, white bread and brown bread. 12, that's all. You could eat as much bacon, cheese, steaks, salad dressing, whatever you want going through the cafeteria line. But you had to eat 12 slices of bread a day. The average weight loss uh, at the end of 60 days two months, was 14 pounds for the white bread and 19 pounds for the brown bread. Without even thinking about it, without even basically knowing what they were doing. Just because the bread is low in fat and it's high in carbohydrates. The fat you eat, the fat you wear, the carbohydrates satisfies the hunger drive. So, no, I don't think bread causes weight problems in people. Do we recommend on the Maximum Weight Loss Program to give you an extra push? Yeah, because you demanded it. So we did it, and it works. <laughs> and it's of value to some of you. And I'm glad I can help that extra part of the population that can't or think they can't eat bread. But I don't, look, bread is staff of life. Always has been, always will be. You throw oil and cheese in it, it's a whole other problem. But, you know, bread... Plain old bread. What do you make out of bread, Mary? How do you make bread? <laughs> bread is just flour, water, yeast, and salt. No, no dead animals? No dead animals. No oil. No oil. Anyway, just, I hope you put that in, co in context. Yeah. Well, I think so. if someone was having a hard time losing weight, that's one of the things that I would tell them to give up. Bread and crackers, those sorts oh, yeah. of things. 
you know, plus the things they put in crackers, you know, most of them have oil, almost all of them have um, well, even like Mary's Gone Crackers, those are technically legal, but, you know, they've got some seeds in them and I could easily eat a whole box. So they, oh, yeah. you know, you've, you've eaten way too many calories and, and fat. So just be careful. Uh, I know you uh, don't have that problem, but some of us do. I, I think, <laughs> I think, I think yeah, that you worry too much about it. I think you just eat the diet and you'll be okay. Okay, next question. This is from Liz. This is a new one. I haven't heard of this. Um, have you heard of the inverse vaccine for autoimmune diseases? No. Inverse vaccine. I don't know. I think maybe I have someplace. Well, uh, let me see. No, you can look at it. If you, I, I, I know what they're trying to do. They're trying to stop the antibodies. So uh, my guess is they're making antibodies to the either to the protein or to the antibodies themselves. Uh -huh. Anyway, I, I will have to wait and see what the tests show. An inverse vaccine composed of the sugar chain carrying a fragment of myelin protein prevented mice from... Okay. I don't know. Well, I think, I think it's an interesting approach, but I don't... It, it, it seems like it just came out. Yeah. No, I, I think they should try something different. You know, so since anyway, I, the, somebody with multiple sclerosis definitely needs to change their diet. And I presented Dr. Roy Swank's work last weekend to this this group and um, showed them how, you know, just in a matter of weeks, the, the tax were down 70% from MS with his patient, just a short time. Anyway, that's I fixed I fixed the food first. I know people would rather do anything than change their diet. Even take a vaccine. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I don't believe in vaccines. Well, uh, do I have to? I, I mean, I have to eat potatoes. I believe in vaccines. <laughs> you know, I'll, I'll eat my cheese and cheese and bacon sandwiches. Just give me the vaccine. <laughs> I know, not you folks, not you folks, <laughs> but you know, friends and relatives. Uh, yeah, they're what, what next? <laughs> well, okay. So you brought up uh, MS, and and that brings me to my next question from Karen. She wants to know if leaky gut causes multiple sclerosis and if she can heal it with this diet. Well, the, the answer to the second question is, I believe you can, so did Dr. Roy Swank. And I think when they finally get around to doing the research correctly, they'll show that uh, by doing a randomized controlled trial. We did one, but it was so heavily biased in favor of the of the control group that we didn't stand a chance from the beginning. And I was told that by the head of neurology. So this is, you know, we randomized the study, John, you just don't have enough people for proper randomization and therefore the test is gonna work out. Well, I said, do it anyways, because I won't live long enough to do it right. So we did the study and we showed a lot of very positive things with MS patients. Uh, what was the question? Well, oh, whether yeah. if you it's heal your- MS. Yeah. Yeah, well, Roy Swank and I've had a lot, a lot of personal meetings with this man. He's one of my, one of my heroes. He used to say, I used to say, how often does the diet fail for MS patients? He one time told me about one in five hundred people. Another time he told me about one in two hundred. I have it on tape him saying that. So you know, it's amazing how well people did. I, I was actually the uh, keynote speaker for when the MS Society honored Don Swank. I also have an agreement with him, a legal agreement to carry on his work, continue to promote what he believed to be true. He was he was the head of neurology of Oregon Health and Science University Medical School in Portland for 23 years. This is no lightweight. Uh, anyway, what do I believe? I believe you can stop the disease with a simple dietary change that we propose. What was the rest of the question? Can you reverse it? No. <laughs> These are scars, multiple sclerosis, multiple scars. These are scars. They're from inflammation due to an attack by a cross-reaction of food proteins to the myelin sheaths. And you go to my website, you can read a ton about that. But uh, that's what I believe to be the case. And uh, do I believe that you can stop it with a failure rate of one in 200 or 300? I don't have the experience Roy Swank had. He had 5,000 patients he took care of. 
as the head of neurology at Oregon Health and Science University. 5,000 people. I believe it, especially since the treatment does no harm. And you need to change it to have a good bowel movement. Like, right, good grief, how much excuse do you need? You got to wait until you're, you're, you can't defecate or urinate anymore or your left leg doesn't work. I think you know, a little, little bit of constipation or indigestion would be enough to get you to change your diet. Mm, not for some people. They'd rather have the vaccine, right? Yeah. <laughs> Give me the vaccine. Give me a pill. Okay, this next question came from Robert. His dad's 82. He's been on a strict McDougal diet for the last four years since he had a heart attack. No angina, great vitals, but he has severe aortic stenosis. Yeah. Um, let's see, he's got three val valves with severe calcification. So they won't do a TAVR procedure unless they do a triple bypass, but he doesn't want to do that. So what do you recommend? Well, I recommend he talk to a few other doctors and he show them the research on bypass surgery, which I have compiled for him. Now, all he has to do is... Uh, well, I don't know what I haven't written. I don't have the latest study. There are two, two later studies out the one I've talked about, or one later study out. And the one later study, they had to wait 10 years. They couldn't show it at five. They had to wait 10 years to show a survival benefit in people who had coronary artery bypass surgery. And then it was only in the very sick. So doesn't have a good record. And I would get a surgeon to sit down and talk to him and say, look, and then again, you might just say, I'm tired of playing the game. Put my graphs in, make you happy. I mean, you're already there. You already got your chest split open. You've already on the heart lung machine, which causes brain damage. I mean, good God, if they take another 30 minutes and put a couple of graphs in you, you've already suffered the biggest risk. You know, I think I'd rather be in the hands of somebody who was good at this and insisted on doing my three graphs in addition to my valve than I would have if somebody had bad hands. And there's some bad hands out there, ladies and gentlemen. Now, I've told you a story about Richard Mamiya, who was on the front page of Time Magazine for his ability to do heart surgery. He was in Hawaii. Richard Mamiya, remember going to his house? I do. All right, Time, front cover of Time Magazine, because he was so good. I was a surgical intern at that time. We could take care of Mamiya's patients four, five, six a day. Nothing ever went wrong. The other guy, you know, I'm not going to mention his name because he's probably still alive, but I know his name. <laughs> his first name's Judd. The other guy, in case any of you know who was in Hawaii doing bypass surgery, you can count on being up all night with one tragedy after the next after he did heart surgery. Count on it. Bad hands are really bad. Be careful. Ask. And so, you know, you got some decisions to make. If you can't find the right doctor with good hands, then you might have to go with the, I'll take good hands over, over the three graphs. That's what I take. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's so bad. But, you, you know, the valve could make such a huge difference in your uncle's life. You know, the valve. Put a new valve in me. Oh, yeah, it's huge. Give him a whole new life ahead of him. So it's a shame they have to hold him hostage to get the valve. So, what can I well, say? My, good idea of getting say? A opinion. My, my, my colleagues, they don't have very many ethics. They don't believe, they just believe in getting the job done, no matter who you hurt. This is the way we do things. Don't you understand that? This is how we do things. Regardless of what this research says, I know best. That's what we say. Thank you. Okay, next question. This is from Danny. Mercury and ethics aside, is low fat white fish good for weight loss? Um, I think he's wanting well, to know you, if fish is better than meat. I don't know. He's wanting to eat one or the other. Well, <laughs> a muscle is a muscle. Per is a calorie, muscle. per calorie. Okay, by weight, it's different. By weight, fish has less cholesterol than beef and pork. But you don't eat by weight. You don't eat a one pound or two pound diet. You eat a 2000 calorie diet. Based on calories, fish has almost twice as much cholesterol as beef and pork. It has no dietary fiber. It's not just methylmercury. 
it's a whole bunch of other contaminants that raise up in the food chain that's in this bus, this, this animal's flesh. Uh, yeah, it's low fat, but it's high protein. So how much protein are you going to eat? Let's just say fish is 40% uh, uh, protein or probably higher than that. It's probably 60, 80% protein. Wait, check. Yeah, go ahead. Check. <laughs> anyway, you know, what happens is you put a tremendous burden on your liver and your kidneys and your bones. I'll show you the research that shows feeding fish causes bone loss. It was tested. I've got the research. You know, where they fed, I think it was mackerel. They fed mackerel to, to these subjects and they measured the bone loss in their urine. It's, it's huge. And, and you put this extra work on the kidneys and the liver. What do you say? 39 grams of protein. All right. Multiply that times four. Well, I'm going to tell I can do that. I can. Okay. It's 160. Where are the calories? It doesn't say calories. How many calories is on it? So you got to give me the calories. All right. Well, I'm going to keep looking. This is a, that's 160 uh, grams of protein for one half of a filet. Yeah. That's a lot of protein. You need about, you don't need much. Maybe, maybe three grams. Yeah, look at that. 178 grams. Of oh, something. Protein. Yeah. I don't know. We that, can't no, do the math. That's how much it was. That's how I much. I don't know how many calories are in the Oh, I, I got to know the okay. calories. That's okay. what But the point being, this is a low fat, no fiber, high protein, highly contaminated food, which is made of animal protein, which has a very serious effect on the liver, bones, kidneys, and kidney stones. No, it's not part of your weight loss program. You might as well chew on a protein supplement. Well, we're destroying our oceans as well, so that's that's not good. Well, she said she said besides the ethics and the methylmercury. She, yeah, but you qualified that. Oh, yeah, you're right. <laughs> All right. Uh, next question. Lots of great questions coming besides, in. I want to say something else. Besides oh, yeah. that fish stink, what is the <laughs> fishy smell, huh? I mean, if somebody said you smell fishy, would you be complimented? Fish stinks. Oh, and, and have you ever been to like a, a fish ware, a warehouse? Oh, yeah. It's just awful. I, I hate it just walking by the meat counter, the fish counter. Yeah. It stinks. It stinks. What do you think it <laughs> smells bad? You're not supposed to eat it. <laughs> you, oh, yeah, I know you can cover it with all kinds of sauces and sugars and stuff to make it palatable. I know that. You put enough salt on anything, you could eat it. <laughs> uh, anyway, I, 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 I love, there's a story you haven't heard, Heather. I was raised in a Catholic neighborhood during my first 12 years of life. And every Friday, guess what we had? Fish Friday, because that was part of the Catholic religion. Still is, but not so much so. And you had to eat fish on Friday to show penance. The rest of the week, you'd have beef. It was Friday night that I dreaded staying at my friend's house because I knew it was Fish Friday. Hated it. <laughs> Don't tell me you want to eat white fish. It just brings sickening thoughts to my mind. <laughs> When I was a kid. Okay, ready for the next question? <laughs> this is from Nicole. She's wanting to know if you have any advice for someone considering practicing this style of medicine in a rural community. How much do you? How much success do you think someone would have? Uh, you know, I, I think it would be dependent upon your skill and commitment. People basically care about themselves and their children and their spouses and their friends. You know, I believe so. Uh, the fact that it's rural, I don't see any connection as opposed to city dwellers. Look at the success, success Bill Riggerhead. Oh, yeah, he was West Virginia. Yeah. yeah. Uh, what was the name of the town? Wheeling? Uh, yeah. Wheeling, West Virginia. We went there. He ran two programs for one of our friends. I mean, that's about as low income and really, place in the world in the yeah. world that you can go and huge success uh bill rieger is his name it's uh wheeling virginia no? wheeling yeah i think it's wheeling west wheeling virginia. South, west virginia west virginia yeah but we did that in the 1980s plus uh here in, in california we took care of the the baptist church in oakland you can imagine the income of people in the heart of oakland 
who belonged to the Baptist Church. Well, I can tell you they weren't high income people. Uh, we took care of the people for the food bank in Sacramento. But again, these are people who have some desperation in their life by and large. And, you know, the success rate for all these groups was pretty darn equal. They loved it. Uh, they loved it. They like they like being well. They like not taking the pills. They like being able to go to the bathroom in the morning. They like the same things everybody else. I wouldn't. Now, how do you get to them? Well, I think you've got to get into their community. Mary and I had a lot of luck over the years when we got involved in uh, various church organizations. And we would uh, get the whole congregation to change. So, you know, there might be a PTA, you know, big churches, little churches, whatever denomination you get into. I think those, those are good groups to persuade. Um, I don't know. I, I can't think of any other. Maybe some of the schools you could teach in the schools. Uh, remember, we are telling the truth. They are. Look. Don't back down. You are right and they're wrong. Let's just put it that way. If they were right, you wouldn't see the massive sickness and obesity in our society. Somebody would have figured it out. I think it's best, best shown by the Ozempic commercials on TV, advertising diabetic pills. There's this, oh, does she make her obese yet? No, she's so, just, just under obese. Yeah. And she's so pretty. And she's dancing around, telling you all happy you'll be on Ozempic. I don't know, that's Jardines. Well, well, I think they use the same girl. Oh, really? Uh, okay, well, I'll well, check They have the time. same person. No, I know the diabetes girl is at least 40 pounds overweight. Anyway, it, yeah, I, 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 I go for it. And you'll get so much reward. People will love what you do. And if you, if you might be up for a fight, I don't know, but I, I have given you the tools to win. Now, I put it down on paper and in video. If you want any argument to win, the whole thing on potatoes, whole thing on protein, whole thing on vitamins, whole, uh, bypass surgery, you name it, I've addressed it if it comes to medicine and nutrition, low carb diets, so Ozempic, you know, I've, I've pretty much written it all down for you. All you got to do is look up the research. I read to come to my conclusions you say oh he didn't make it up it's true <laughs> thank you next question this is from john he says since chlorothaladone is a diuretic and lowers blood pressure would it make sense to also lower water intake as part of the solution the, and then his next question is does much water intake increase blood pressure no, water intake doesn't increase blood pressure. You're dealing with a very fine regulatory system. And only by poisoning the system with chlorothaladone, and it is poisoning, that's the correct word to use. It's a chemical interference that causes these kinds of effects on the human body. Poison is the correct term, all right? These poisons, they paralyze the kidneys so that the kidneys can't hold onto water. And so you're in a total volume deficit. Otherwise, if you drink less water, the kidneys conserve water. If you drink more water, you pee it out. You know, but if you take a drug that poisons your regulatory systems, then you end up doing things like dropping blood pressure. And by the way, by the, we didn't, you don't <laughs> want to know this. So. Oh, I'll tell you anyways. <laughs> by the way, these diuretics probably do, don't work primarily by excreting water from the system. Now, I have to look it up again because I haven't looked at it since I was in residency. But as I recall, back then, they showed that diuretics worked by dilating the blood vessels throughout the body. Yeah. Oh. And the effect on the kidneys was not too big a deal. It was mostly by, by dilating the blood vessels. Of course, when you dilate the blood vessels, you open up this huge, huge, huge bed. Yeah. Which you can imagine what happens to the blood pressure when you open up this huge, huge bed of blood vessels. Yeah, so anyway, I've never told anybody that, Mary. Oh, not since, I, I, not since I've been a resident. I remember <laughs> that was right up here. You need to learn something new every show. So, 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 the little bits of memory come back, and, <laughs> you know, hopefully five o'clock Pacific time every Sunday. All of the good, all the, all the, all the good things come up. Yeah, I hope so. 
Okay, next question. Um, this is from Deborah. She's been whole food plant-based for four years, has a BMI of 19, but her red blood count is low. She does have macrocytic anemia. Any okay. thoughts? Well, macrocytic anemia are classically, most physicians would say you're B12 deficient. So I think she needs to look into her B12 levels. Uh, the other thing is she's mildly anemic, which is just based upon the standards of the population. In general, vegan, healthy vegetarians need less blood. It's just like a smoker needs more blood. Your hemoglobin goes up when you smoke. So if you improve the circulation and the respiratory system, the hemoglobin goes down. And so in general, our people run a little lower hemoglobin level because of better health. They don't need all the extra blood cells around, whereas a smoker does. Uh, but you need to also check in addition to B12, you need to check, make sure you're not bleeding. Now you'd notice vaginal bleeding, but bleeding from the stool is sometimes hard to detect. So you wanna check the stool for blood on three occasions. You get these uh, over on Amazon or some stool test for blood. And check it out and if it's okay, that's pretty good. And then you can go to a doctor who can do some blood tests. They can check you for ferritin and serum iron, serum iron binding capacity, a reticulocyte count. And, you know, they do all those things on you to see what might be going on. You know, and that's, that's what I would do. You need a workup, somewhat of a workup, unless you think, well, my hemoglobin, they say it should be 14. It's really 11 and a half. Well, so what's 11 and a half? You're, 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 you're comparing yourself with a whole bunch of sick people. And by the way, white blood cell counts also drop when you follow the diet. White blood cells are to fight infection or to fight any type of distress in the body. That's why you make your white blood cells. So if you're eating healthy, you don't have all this inflammation going on your white cell count becomes lower. It's normal. People worry about, it. oh, I'm on a range. Yeah, you're on a range <laughs> compared to a bunch of sick people, which is the population that they establish their ranges from. These are Americans. These are sick people. So we're different because you, 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 you know we're different. You ask them to eat the way we eat, and they'll tell you how different we are. Well, the difference makes a big difference in the body, and sometimes you fall outside of on the good side of uh, abnormality, which is red blood cells and white blood cells, and body weight. You probably, probably, I bet you, if you follow the McDougal diet, and your friends, you know, at least the old friends, tell you you're too thin. All referenced on the Walking Society, folks. <laughs> them sick Americans, eighty percent of them are overweight or obese. Half are pre-diabetic or diabetic. Half uh, die prematurely of heart disease. You want to know what I mean compared to these people? I don't. I don't. Thank you. So it's almost like the lab test sheet that you get. And when you have a lab test done and you look at it, it's really like it's almost worthless. Well, because when, it's, it's based on sick people. That, yeah. And when you get upset about small changes, like I have had patients told their cholesterol is too low, you know? Yeah. And so what, compared to what? Well, compared to a bunch of people who have a 50% chance of dying of heart disease. Well, I want it too low, you know? Uh, yeah, so, uh, but, but you know, in general, Mary, when I'm looking at a lab test, I'm not looking for minor variations. I'm oh. looking at the liver tests that are elevated three times normal or, you know, creatinine, which is a kidney test that's elevated twice normal. You know, I'm looking at those kind of things, not just a, a, a few. Uh, oh, I know you are, but yeah, somebody else well, maybe is not. Often our patients get confused because yeah. they'll go to the doctor. Doctors say, uh, you ought to get off that diet. Your weight count's too low. You know, I think you should stop that diet or at least eat some meat because your cholesterol is too low. And also, uh, you know, the, when all you do is take care of sick people, to have a healthy person walk in your office is a really strange event most doctors never see it why because we don't go to the doctor <laughs> that's one of the reasons uh, but there's not, there are not enough of us folks and that's what i hope we're doing is we're creating more people that think we like we do so bring your friends and relatives five o'clock pacific times every sunday night to our youtube channel 
so we can help your friends and relatives. And they can have a good time too. I mean, well, how much more fun could you have than a half, an hour with Mary and John and Heather? I mean, good grief. Aren't you tired of watching the news or reruns on TV? Five o'clock, Pacific time, Sunday night, every week. We'll be here. And if you miss it, you can watch the recording. You can watch the recording. And you can also come to our 12-day program, which is, you really want to be different. You want your life different. You want to have all the things you think you deserve in terms of the way you look, the way you feel, the way you function. You want it back. Then you stop doing what makes you sick. What makes you sick is the food. It plain and simple is the food. Fix the food. You'll be amazed at how many things you don't really suffer from <laughs> that were due to food poisoning. You know, your greasy forehead, your wax in your ears, your stinky armpits, your bad farts. I mean, it just goes on and on. I didn't know all those things were related to my food. <laughs> well, they are. Pretty amazing. Amazing. Okay, next question. This is from the experiencer. What could be other causes of high blood creatinine levels besides chronic kidney disease? My liver function... Oh, well, they're saying kidney, even liver function seems to be normal. But anyway, is there another uh, cause of high? Well, you know, it's a pretty good sign that you have kidney problems when your creatinine gets you know, above 1.5. You know, when it gets to two or three or four or five or six, you're in big trouble. Can it get, well, if you eat a lot of meat, uh, creatinine comes from muscle. If you were very dehydrated, if you take certain medications that, you know, some dehydrate you, and that would raise creatinine. But most of the time, uh, you have enough kidney function, so the creatinine doesn't go up, even if you're dehydrated or you eat a lot of meat. But those are some circumstances that would cause it. Uh, if you are catatonic in the sense that your muscles are breaking down from some rhabdomyolysis or some other horrible disease, your creatinine to come up because creatinine is from muscle. You eat a lot of muscle, your creatinine goes up, but not enough to, you know. So I, I would uh, certainly find out what's going on. Uh, creatinine levels in our program are cut in half. Yeah, in seven days. And don't you usually also recommend that if somebody has a, a really strange test, they have it repeated? Oh yeah, labs make mistakes. And for you to spend a week or a day or a month worrying about something that they made a mistake on just doesn't seem right. So go back and get it corrected, right? Or repeat it right away. And there should be some corollaries. I mean, it's not just one tap lab test that goes bad. There should be things in the history and the physical and the other lab tests that confirm that this is not a healthy person. You know, you... you as I say, I've been at this for 55 years, and I can tell a lot about people, you know, that maybe other people can't, because that's been my job, is to look at people and talk to them. And I think you find me quite often saying something like, I'll, I'll, I'll watch a, a news show on TV, and I'll say, that guy has indigestion. You do that all the time. time. I go, how do you know? And I said, well, watch him. And he'll, <laughs> he'll be belching all the time. And, uh, and I'll say something, I'll say something else that nobody else would notice. Because that's my job. And there is a guy that belches all the time on <laughs> MSNBC, you know. <laughs> so. Okay, uh, let's see. We've just got a few minutes left. We have lots of questions. So next question. We get this a lot. Matheson wants to know if AFib can be reversed. They're taking Apixaban, five milligrams twice a day. I'm trying to think of what that drug is. Anyway, it doesn't make any difference. No, it can't be reversed unless you undergo something called ablation, which I think you should look into. Uh, I'm not a proponent. I'm not going to speak negative about it because I don't know enough about it. But uh, there have been some positive reports. There's been some criticism, serious criticisms. And, uh, you know, it's not Aliquis Mary, it's something else. Yeah, but well, is that I what it is? Aliquis? I don't oh, know Aliquis. Why don't you just Aliquis. say Aliquis? Yeah. I don't know those big names. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's what I put in here. Yeah, and yeah, that's what it came up. You, you have to take Aliquis. If, if you flunk the Chad formula, this is very important for you to do. 
you need to look up the CHAD score. It's spelled capital C, capital H, capital A, capital D. I bet you get if you put the small letters in too. CHAD, C-H-A-D or C-H-A-D-S, CHAD score. And what it tells you is whether or not you would benefit or be harmed based upon your characteristics, whether or not you take blood thinners. Used to be Coumadin, now it's Eliquis. And you know there are a couple other blood thinners. Uh, what I would say is what I've learned so far about the two treatments, I would pick Eliquis over the Coumadin for a whole bunch of reasons. But healthy people shouldn't be on these drugs, neither Coumadin or aspirin or Eliquis. And that's what the CHADS score tells you, is that if you have a certain score, which is related to your past history, like if you had a stroke or not, or your, you know, your, your blood pressure or your age or whatever, it gives you an idea whether or not you would benefit more or be harmed more by taking the standard recommendation. It's called the CHAD score. Every doctor knows about it or should and practice by it. But from what I've seen, too few do use the CHAD score. I think it's the reason is they don't see any healthy people. <laughs> so they all flunk the CHAD score. So why should they bother looking at it? But see, in my practice, it's different. You know, they, they don't have high cholesterol. They, they don't have high blood pressure. You know, they're, they get older. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, it's called the CHAD score. Look it up. Save yourself some trouble. I put the link in the chat. Okay, next question. This is from Lisa. Her husband has three stents, is taking statins, has a high calcium score. Do you think he could come off the statins? on a whole food plant-based diet? You know, this is a judgment call, Heather. And, and I'll tell you, based upon his history that he told me, I'd probably ask him to stay on the statins, to stay on them. And, and that means, the reason being is you might as well take every advantage that you have available. Why throw the baby out with the wash water? Even if it helped a little bit. He's in a category where secondary prevention with statins is indicated because he has a high calcium score. I assume he's had heart trouble of other kinds. So uh, I, would, I would just take the attitude. Now, if he said he didn't want to take the statins, that's another story. I, I would not argue with a patient who said that and was well informed, you know, because you get hurt by statins. So I think, uh, you know, it's a judgment call between his doctor and himself. I can tell you from my side of the bench, or the desk, uh, often, I will recommend people continue their statins when they're that sick. At least nobody could criticize you. I mean, you've done everything. So when the bad thing happens, you can, well, I, I took the medicine, I followed the diet. Neither one of these people were right. Or hopefully, <laughs> we're both right. Well, and as you say, there are some good drugs out there. There are a few yeah, things you recommend. Uh, unfortunately, statins uh, have fallen out of that category. I used to prescribe them a lot more than I do these days, Heather. But lately, the, the data has been so disappointing for statins that, you know, I, I, I wanted to have a drug that I could feel good about. And statins were that drug in the past. I don't, Aren't there some statins that are better than others? Yeah, they're, they're uh, what they call lipopho lipophilic drugs. No, lipophobic. Uh, <laughs> I use Pravacol, Pravastatin. Uh, Lipitor is pretty good. It depends upon how easily the drug gets into the inside of the cell. Pravastatin doesn't get inside the cells very much. So it doesn't do a lot of the negative things. It kind of does its job outside of the cells. It's called a lipophilic drug. Doesn't like to go through the lipid film cell membranes. Again, why do we keep saying more than they want to know? Well, sorry. I thought, no, I should, I should just give them a simple answer. You should. But, but, you, but you know, can. I have all these things that pop in my head. I, I want to tell them. All right, it's six o'clock. We've run out of time. <laughs> well, Heather, I know you're, you're getting full in your next program, but there might be some cancellations and you will have a habit of letting an extra two or three people in. When's the next program? October 13th, we're filling up. I included the link in the chat. You can find out more information on our right. website. Um, and so you've, got this, you've got this series of five lectures I gave 
which you're charging a lot less for than I expected. They're on sale right yeah. now. Is that she's got a sale going right now? But you never brought it, you never asked me if I would sell my important words for sale. But I think it's good. I hope you get the message out. There are five lectures I've given that uh, we now have on tape, and uh, there are 10 hours of, of uh, lecture material. I know you'll enjoy every minute of obesity, heart disease, cancer, diabetes, and general nutrition. They're the core, the core information. 10 hours. I so I condensed 55 years into 10 hours. <laughs> It's the most up-to-date thing I have. Anyway, here they're selling them at a discount rate. And what else do we have going on? I guess that's all for now. Mm -hmm. Believe it or not. Great yeah. weekend. Thank you, plantrician people. It was really fun to be with yeah. all of you folks. A it's lot awesome. great seeing everyone. That's what I enjoyed the most. Well, I'm sure Heather did too. Yeah. People that we hadn't seen in years. People that we've only seen on Zoom. It was so nice to have people come, come up to us and say, hi, mm -hmm. you know, it's nice to see you in person. It really was. So it was fun. Great. Oh, well. Okay. Thanks, Mom and Dad. Thanks, right. everyone, for being here. It was a great hour. We will see you all next Sunday at 5 p.m. Pacific. Okay, have a great okay. right. tell, tell your Tell your friends, only the ones you care a lot about, <laughs> <laughs> and a few of your enemies. Tell them, too. Bye-bye.